Good evening from Jerusalem, Israel. This is Lowell Joseph Gallen, founder of the Root and Branch Association Limited, established in 1981 and celebrating our 40th anniversary, because this is 2021. I would like to welcome our viewers and listeners worldwide and our live Zoom studio audience to this evening's program in our Root and Branch Association Limited English Language Conference and Lecture Series, broadcasting from Jerusalem, Israel. And now celebrating our first second quarter century for our lecture series, having just concluded the first quarter century from January 1995 until December 2020. Today is Tuesday, April 27, 2021 in the Gregorian calendar. And it is the 15th day of ER in the Hebrew Israelite calendar. We are broadcasting from the city of Israel, no, the land of Israel, city of God, Jerusalem, hill of the priests, Gibat Hanania, Abu Tor, overlooking Mount Moriah, where the third and final Israelite temple, we believe, of Jerusalem will soon be under reconstruction and stand forever. As per the prophet Ezekiel's vision, please see the biblical book of Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. Now, our speaker for this evening is a longtime friend and colleague of mine. I really shouldn't start. If I'll go into it now, we'll have no talk. So I have to leave that. Uh, Miss Laura Ledbetter is going to speak about her life as a drama therapist. I think we could also use some therapy these days. And to introduce her will be my longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Les Glassman. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Les, who's going to introduce Laura. Well, Lowell, well, thank you so much. And Lowell, I wanna take this opportunity and also wishing you a happy birthday for your upcoming birthday. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Laura, it's really an honor and a privilege to have you here this evening. And um, what an amazing topic, my life as a drama therapist. Wow. So uh, I'm just going to give a short bio because, as Lowell said, otherwise we could spend the whole night just thinking about your, <laughs> your achievements and what you do. But you're a registered drama therapist uh, and you got your, um, your degree through Hunter College. Um, you have a, a master's of uh, science from in counseling from Mercy College in Duxbury, uh, Westchester County in New York. And um, you've also been involved in the circus. You know, these are things that the kids dream of. But you used to do a Spanish wave, which uh, you go on a, a wire and you do aerial ballet, which sounds absolutely frightening and fascinating amazing and you come from a very distinguished family your mom was also very involved in the circus um, she did rodeos and she was involved in, in equestrian with um, horses and your grandfather was a blacksmith and interesting he had a tremendous close connection to Jean uh, Autry um, these are stories one couldn't even make up it's, it's unbelievable but you work now as a, um, a creative artist and a drama therapist in Yonkers uh, in, with psychiatric patients and patients needing your help. And, um, you know, it's going to be so fascinating to hear your life as a drama therapist. So without any further ado, um, could you enlighten us into the amazing work that you do? Thank you, Les. I've um, worked in different arenas in my life, and um, I was fortunate to have the training as a drama therapist at Hunter College in New York City while I was getting my master's at Mercy College in New York under the guidance of a dear theater professor, Dr. Pat Sternberg, who took me on. I was her last drama therapy student for supervision at Hunter College in New York City. And I, I knew with my background being in the circus and, and the love of theater and the arts, I wanted to use drama as a way to, to provide healing to, to seniors in nursing homes, um, 
the population that I'm working with now in mental health. And my dream came true and I became a drama therapist. So now currently I'm working at St. Joseph's Hospital in Yonkers. I um, am very fortunate to attend Manhattan College here in the Bronx, which offers a program that I can take the required coursework. I'm not getting the degree from Manhattan College, but I'm doing what Albany, New York State wants me to do to be licensed officially as an LMHC, licensed mental health counselor would be the initials behind my name once I pass my state exam and complete two internships, which I'm about to begin this fall and do 300 hours for the state and then do another 300 hours and be on my way to maybe do private practice or continue clinical work in a hospital. So I'm really fortunate that it's all coming together like a jigsaw puzzle. And I'm fortunate that I have the health and with the pandemic going on, it's been very stressful and times have been hard and they need more mental health counselors with the way of the world of what we're going through right now. And I just hope and pray that we get through this pandemic and I can continue my journey and do all the work I have to do. Um, I have two more weeks left of this last graduate course that I'm doing online through Manhattan College we were not allowed to attend we're doing it virtually so by the fall i'll be going once a week for my internship class we hope to all cons you know be on campus and um have the college running up full-time capacity but we're yet to see what's going to happen but i'm i'm thankful that i met lowell through his um father at the hebrew home here in riverdale i was blessed um to meet Lowell when he came over from Israel and his father was like a grandfather to me and I love doing the storytelling with his dad and I have great memories and it's been wonderful and I'm I I'm blessed to have had those memories and give him the storytelling and the wisdom and we launched the Laura and Lowell show while he was here and we had a few stories written up in the Riverdale Press. And we had did many interviews, which was quite a joy in my life to have that opportunity to hear so many folks stories and the creativity that involved with it. And um, I also am a member of the Screen Actors Guild. I failed to mention that I finally got in the union and I, I've done some roles. Um, and it was an interesting journey, but I've put it on hiatus. I still keep my membership, but I, I, my goal is to get this license. And I'm just um, focused right now on this um, journey that I have with my education, but I'm thankful and I'm thankful to have this interview with both of you and thank you for having me. <laughs> Is there any other questions that maybe uh, you're curious about? Uh, um, there is, Laura. Can I just ask you, um, you know, they say that laughter is actually the best medicine. Yes. And um, and if you could relate some of the stories or how you have helped patients through laughter and through telling stories or hearing stories from them. I think patients relating their stories to you and you giving a... Um, listening to them and, and becoming part of their lives, I think that that's in a tremendous therapy for the patient as well. It is. Um, I, I love the laughter. Um, you know, growing up with the circus and clowning and humor therapy, um, I have so many memories. And I just got a book sent to me from a clown friend of mine in Sarasota, Florida, and he wrote it all about his life as a clown. And he, his title of the book was, is it God or is it destiny? And I thought it was just so powerful. Um, and when I share that journey with my patients in the hospital and the humor that comes up when we role play and we reverse roles and we act out monologues and we do improvisations there's so many stories and there's so much laughter which is healing 
and it helps them while they're in the hospital because we're dealing with real life stories that um, yes, it is the play space, it's the arena that I'm creating in the moment, but I'm allowing them to, to act out another role in their life, which helps them heal with what they're facing. Could be trauma, could be bereavement. There's so many different, you know, mental health issues that come up. And even with this COVID, the losses that we all maybe have known somebody that have passed from it. So the the humor is very important to laugh and have that 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 joy because it releases endorphins in the body and and tension. And I'm all about wellness. And I have to do a presentation um, in my final class about a certain type of therapy called dialectical behavioral therapy, which uses humor and wellness to heal. And they found, especially with adolescents, it helps. Um, this is a popular therapy that is really working. And also with borderline personality disorders, which is a tough population to work with. Um, I'm learning about all these different populations that I work with. So humor is a big component of healing. Yes. Can I just mention something, Laura? And this is... Uh... Something absolutely quite fascinating that I've only discovered in the last couple of months, um, having actually been able to interview quite a few survivors, Holocaust survivors, um, uh, there, were, there was a thread that some of the survivors actually mentioned that when they were, their heads were shaven and they, they were tattooed, they actually laughed at some of them actually were their friends, they would like make a joke um, at their situation. And that made them feel human because they were made to feel totally as a number and inhuman. And here by them laughing, it gave them an individuality that they could laugh amongst their friends and feel that, wow, we still are human. And they mentioned that it was a tremendous therapy for them going through this tremendously horrendous and hair raising and harrowing ordeal. But because they still kept their sense of humor um, it actually gave him the strength to continue. And this is, there's a Dr. Chaya Ostroff I met, who's a, um, she's a author and she's a, a lecturer. And she wrote a book as Laughter as Therapy in the Holocaust, which is absolutely phenomenal because um, not laughing at the Holocaust, but people in the Holocaust, how they use laughter to, to just, better their lives in a way and it gave them the strength to continue so uh, this laughter is, is so that I've discovered very recently yes laughter is i know that low with your dad we used to have laughs he he would make me laugh and um he would create these puppets out of bottles and make collage puppets and and they told stories and, right, and yes they, and they were funny and they were, and I was spreading, taking his puppets all over Westchester to different nursing homes. Right. You, I'll throw in a little here now. Sure. Uh, I remember my father, as we both know, spoke fluent street Spanish from his practice in El Barrio, the ghetto from 1952 in the South Bronx. And I remember then when I would uh, visit him at the Hebrew home, that he would he would speak in Spanish, which they loved, to the young ladies who worked there, many of whom came from Central and South America, Mexico, and the islands. And I was horrified, and I said to my mother, uh, my father would tell them dirty jokes. <laughs> and I thought, how can he do that? And my mother said, you don't understand the culture. They love it. And he can add away with it because an old guy so they get slapped or they they thought this was very entertaining didn't bother them at all they weren't that racy but uh i said really mommy daddy's talking like that to the young ladies she said you see, my mother said you don't understand the culture they think this is hysterically funny they're not shocked they think it's funny for them that was humor therapy that a 97 year old man is telling them wise cracks but that he could do it in Spanish, which is their <laughs> language. So 
Laura, could you say something? I mean, I have so many questions where to start, but let's start at the beginning. You do rodeos for autistic children. Yes, and I did. Could you yeah. say something about that? Where on the spectrum are they in terms of autism? Are they severely disturbed, non-functional, or are they on the higher ends of the spectrum, like savants or all of the above? And how do you do that? I think once a year, at least. Well, I did low, but when the pandemic hit, that all right. got right. Um, wiped out. So to answer your question, I worked across the whole spectrum with all of the above, what you just had mentioned from severe to highly, um, even genius level at some, I had adults. I just didn't have kids either. I had all ages. So um, it was, a. I did the roping with them at a, at a farm upstate New York. Right. And it was a big event once a year. And they loved being able to show their parents how they could master the art of roping and lassoing and say, mommy, daddy, I'm a cowboy. I'm a cowgirl. Look at me. And they had this teaching horse, Peggy, which they would get on and, you know, they would be afraid of real horses, but the wooden horse, they could learn how to steer it. It would light up. So be, that's creative self-expression was getting them over the trauma of a big, you know, 800 pound horse um, that, you know, they were afraid of and, and just mastering a skill to show their family and their peers it was a great experience to do that and I I love carrying that western heritage of, of my mother being a cowgirl um it's funny Lowell that we're talking about this because last Saturday was the day she passed away uh -huh. and I gave my brother a big eight by ten photo of her on a white horse in Tucson Arizona and he was just so touched. He said it was the best birthday present I could have ever given him. Um, and, you know, I, I've been thinking of her and, and her cowgirl legacy. And, and I miss all those days when I used to be able to do the Pegasus show. And it's just been a different world now since COVID hit. It's um, it's just different and I miss it but I have those memories like you said and I'm glad that I had the opportunity to work with that population. Well I don't think that the restrictions will go on forever and sooner or later people will get back to rodeos and the, the Pegasus the Pegasus Foundation is that the name of it? Yeah they're they're allowing people they're starting to resume their programming again up at the farm so it's slowly opening up right now. So maybe in the future, I can plan to do something and get back in the saddle, as they say. Remember when we did that interview at the Twisted Bit, Law with Danny? I, I certainly do. And uh, those, uh, they're all up on our channel. As far as I'm concerned with our show, as I said, when we met in 2012, give it 10 years, we're just getting started. The technology caught up with us. And yes. I believe that we're just getting started. Now I have a question again, so many. Why horses, pets, the word pet, you know, your pet, the, the dog, the cat. Why, what is special about horses? There've been books and films made about horses and their unique ability to relate to emotionally, and well, we're all emotionally impaired uh, people. Why, why horses, why not ducks? I because, mean, all animals are wonderful. <laughs> what is it about the horse? <laughs> well, the horses have been predators, as you know, um, since their existence. To They've been in wars. They've been um, able to survive. They have a natural instinct inside of them that protects other people and themselves and their species. So there's some very con special connection with horses that they found through research, through equestrian therapy right now with veterans coming back from wars um, with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I did a training at Pe Pegasus with just doing groundwork with the horse, bonding with the horse, petting the horse, 
walking with the horse. It wasn't about teaching the veterans how to ride. It was developing that trust and that bond because horses are very smart animals. And like I said, they can, they, their sense of hearing when there's danger, they know when a storm is coming, they know when there's trouble, if there's other animals or if there's danger. So they, they're very aware and it teaches us humans to be very aware of our surroundings, mm -hmm. to focus on that concentrate, looking at the horse in the eye, um, knowing to hear their heartbeat, putting their, your hand on their chest to hear that heart, to feel our heartbeat. So we're on a ground and we're supported by the ground, but we, we learn to bring that feeling upward through our body and it's so healing. It helps the veterans open up. Maybe they've been shut down or they can't express themselves and the horse brings it out of them and they have a good cry and they start to talk and they start to bond with the animal. So like with children with disabilities, with the autism, with um, different development, mental disabilities, the horses teach trunk control, support, posture, self-esteem, confidence building skills. So there's so much research that it's so therapeutic and it's so wonderful to build a really, some people can't talk to others, but they can talk to the horse. They can um, relate to the animal in a, in a special bond, which is so, it's a miracle. It's, it's, it's wonderful. I, I just, I, I, I've seen it help people. And I know from being around horses, how much they help me when I look at them and, or, stroke them and ride them and I miss that I miss um riding when I used to go riding I did some western riding and English and I like western riding better because it's free and you just get on the horse whereas English it's a whole discipline with the helmet and the gear and the process of learning English riding but, I have so many questions, but I'm going to defer to Les because okay, so I know I'm, he does too. Yeah. So I've got a question with regard to animals. Um, in, in our area, in, in Jerusalem, in Baitagan rather, there's an old man that we see every day walking, and he had a little dog and on a leash, and he'd walk up and down the road. And then one day I saw him, and the dog wasn't with him. And I asked him, what happened to your dog? And he said, no, no, he, he died. And about, it took him about a month, and now he's got another dog. And I think that dog, him walking with that dog, he relates so much to that dog that I think it just gives him company. And it, it's, it's, it's such, such a wonderful thing to see. And, I think, and this is my personal view with, with children. When you take them to like a petting zoo, or if a child has got a pet animal, a pet dog in particular, um, I think it's, it's a, it can also be... A, and you'd be the expert in this, but a tremendous therapeutic um, for the children to relate to animals. Um, have you had that in your experience? Well, yes, it's funny, Les, you're talking about this. My professor who has her own private practice and is a psychologist says she brings her dog for the children. Mm -hmm. And when the dog's there, she doesn't exist. They talk more to the dog than talking to her. She's not even in the picture. So the dog does open them up and they bond with the animal in a special way. And so the dog becomes the therapist and the dog becomes the healer. And I know I have my own little 16 year old dachshund. He's my best friend, my companion. I used to bring him to the Hebrew home to visit Lowell's father. We did pet therapy. All the seniors would say, well, Laura, it's nice to see you, but where's Dusty? We really would would love to see Dusty. It's not that we don't like you, but Dusty was always, where's Dusty? <laughs> and Laura, I'll just, I'll just mention, we did a program. Now had an amazing guest on uh, Hebrew as an uh, influence in world languages. But the word dog uh, in Hebrew is kenev, which is from the, from the root of um, lay, which is a heart. And that's what a dog is. It has a, a, a very unique heart. And there's, there's a reason why it's man's best friend. There, there's absolutely, a, absolutely. No, there's, there's, there's so much joy that you get and love that it's unconditional. They don't talk back to you. They wait for you. They're loyal to you. 
I can leave for the day and go to work and leave a little bone in his kennel and I'll come home and he'll still have the bone there. He wants to eat it because I'm back and he feels comfortable to eat the little milk bone that I left. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. They have their ways. I mean, he's so smart and I'm just blessed he's still going strong and I give him the very best care that I, I took him on an outing. We, we took a ride to the pet store on Central Avenue over near Epstein's Low, and he got his canned food and his goodies and he was enjoying the sunshine through the window in the car and he was my little co-pilot, so it was wonderful. <laughs> Laura, could, could you say something, uh, um, this is coming back to me slowly but steadily, about the, the father of drama therapy. We've discussed that, the, the, the doctors or Dr. whoever- Dr. Marino. Was, right, Dr. Could, Marino. Where it, when did it begin and get the name drama therapy? Was it someone from Finland or someplace? No, he was, um, he lived England. in Beach. He lived in Beacon, New York, up, up in the Hudson Valley, and he had an yes. institute called the Marie. If you Google the Marino Institute, Marino you'll institute. read about Dr. Marino and how he started doing psychodrama and and how he had patients up in Beacon and 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 it was a, a haven for you know all types of folks. It became an institute and it became very famous and. For years, he was doing drama therapy and they just took it a step higher and they started doing more research. And then there were many people that got on board and started writing and publishing. And then it became a major at NYU. And I tried to audition for that program, but I did not get in purposely because it was very expensive and the director of the program knew I would be better off right, at Hunter. I remember that. And it's a CUNY system so I could afford it. And I was getting the same training as what I would have gotten at NYU. And I was blessed. And um, I just think that's a really good question because um, Dr. Marino, he's, he made the way for drum, for the creative arts and and it, it's wonderful. I'm blessed to have that training and, and Pat Sternberg who mm -hmm. took me on as her last student and just the experiences I've had, Lil. When was that? When did Dr. Marino do his work? Are we going back a hundred years? No, he started in the 1950s. 1950s. Mm -hmm. Now, was the use of drama's therapy uh, so, I mean, for many years, people play charades and families, the role-playing children do that. Uh, how far back does it go in other forms where it would have had another name, where well, community this book, theater? Drama as Therapy, Phil mm -hmm. Jones. It started in the UK too. I should say the UK start is big in drama therapy and they might've been doing it just around or before Dr. Marino, but it's a very important um, therapy in, in England. And Phil Jones wrote this book and he also wrote, I'll show you another book that he wrote, which is Drama as Therapy, Theater as Living. Mm -hmm. And they're wonderful techniques and I'm blessed to have those techniques. And so she had drama, Pat wrote, who's in your shoes? Mm -hmm. Pat Sternberg. So there's a lot of research and theater as conflict resolution. Pat wrote this using theater when one has conflicts because life is all about conflict constantly. Yeah. Are, are Phil Jones and Patricia Sternberg still alive? Pat p passed away about oh. seven years ago, but Phil Jones is still alive living in England. Yes. What is your experience with drama therapy in the prison system? To what extent is that? I uh, never did I any, any work. A lot of my colleagues do work in that system. That's, um, but I do get patients at the hospital that have been in the system. I have one man 
um, who did like 30 years. Um, so they're building new lives and, um, and my colleagues like it. They find it challenging. Um, it's it's a, a fascinating area, but I, I never had worked in that area. I've always worked nursing home and hospitals. Yeah. In the drama therapy, to what extent does it involve speaking as opposed to doing something like bouncing a basketball or running around or opening and closing a door or as opposed to uh, just people talking to each other? To what extent does it involve uh, music, for example? What, what are the, uh, is that Dusty? Or is that the bird? I just heard. It's a bird clock. It goes off on, on every hour. It, um rings on with different bird sounds every hour. <laughs> Lovely, it's very nice. <clears throat> but so, um, the drama therapy uses art, it uses music, it uses role-playing theater. It, it uses so many different modalities to help people. It's not limited to just drama. There's ways to use music, there's, um, ways to use art therapy. There's ways to use storytelling. There's so many different modalities. I would imagine it would be, uh, unless someone is, has, is born with it or is trained in improvisational theater, most people are a little bit, that's one of the reasons people get drunk and take drugs to become less inhibited to do stuff where they might be self-conscious about. I'm talking about normal spectrum stuff, that it would seem to me that that something structured like this would allow uh, regular people to be able to do things that if, if one wasn't born into it as a, an, a born actor, an actress, a comedian, say, okay, look, uh, put on a hat and pretend you're Charlie Chaplin, I don't know what it is, that I would imagine most people would uh, react very well to it. No one forces anyone to do something, but I would I would imagine that most people presented with it at any age would say, "Well, that's that's a lot of fun. I can feel silly, but it's okay because this is the game we're playing, like Monopoly or something." Well, it's it, it it's also helpful to just do for fun. I mean, it helps you grow and learn about yourself in ways and explore roles you were never familiar with in life, and and it opens you up to take on that imaginary role and, and, and have the feedback and the witnessing from others and expression and the poetry and the writing, creative writing comes from it. And, and they can, you know, one can take bad experiences in life and rebuild their lives just by doing these creative therapy exercises. They're wonderful. I'm gonna defer again to Les because I know he has his own questions and okay. I don't wanna monopolize the conversation with uh, mine. Uh, Laura, your questions are amazing. And, um, and Laura, thank you so much. It's just such a pleasure to have you and to listen to you and your experiences. But Laura, growing up in the circus, uh, were you a very small child when, um, when you were growing up and were your parents very involved? I know your mother was very involved in the circus, but did you spend a lot of well, time- Well, my mother, my mother really didn't do circus. She just did rodeos, but we lived around families that were circus performers. So I was exposed to families that traveled in the circus where I grew up in Sarasota, Florida. And when she met my father and settled down and got out of show business, she had those memories. And I had 10 years of those memories before she passed away. She was 36 when I lost her and I was 10. And then her brother, my uncle came down to Florida to raise my brother and me up here in New York. And that's how I made it up here to New York. So that was my base of um, being um, introduced to the circus world and having dear friendships and having to the chance to see them when they came to New York. And, and it was like home week. I would connect with families that I knew since I was a little girl and keep those relationships going. And um, 
it was a special, you know, gift. I, I know, like you said, um, children wish they could run away and join the circus. It's like a fantasy dream come true. But I grew up around it and I, I lived it and I got a chance to quit my job in my 20s and go on the road and travel with the circus and get it out of my system and do it actually. And we did small towns in upstate New York and we traveled all over doing school shows. So it was a wonderful experience. And I was glad and blessed that I had that experience to do that. And Rory, do you think that there's still a future for the circus? Do you think it's as popular now? Well, before the COVID, but do you think it's still popular as it was in the past? In ways now that it's going to change because they've um, found that it's still powerful and it's still respected as an, an art form and you have to really love and have that skill and practice. So they're, they've set up um, circus schools all across the United States and they keep growing and they find the after school programming helps um, different children and their self-esteem and confidence. They even work with youth detention centers um, with kids that um, have been in trouble um, and they find circus arts helps them. And so it is gonna always still remain and, and continue to grow. It might not grow as much as the days when you had different traveling circuses going all over the US and performing and Ringling Brothers no longer exists. They used to come into Madison Square Garden every year and they stopped that with the animal rights activists yeah. um, and it just, it changed the industry in that capacity, but it, it's still gonna be an art form like theater and dance because there's so much history to circus and there's so much to learn about it. But that's a good question. Now I have, I have a, uh, oh, am I live? Yes. Uh, again, historically, we've discussed this and I'm asking the question because I didn't know any of this until I met you and started to look into it. Could you say something about a comedy dell'arte, the, the history of the circus? How far back do circuses go? The Bro Romans talked about bread and circuses. I mean, I know that's something you know something about, and very few people do. Well, commedia dell'arte is an art form of different clowning and theater techniques in the theater. And it goes back in, in Greece and Italy and all over. Europe. Um, it was very, that was, that was showbiz, that was theater back in those days. And, and there's so much different styles of clowning that came from, from that era of Commedia dell'arte. You have the Auguste clown face, you have the um, different styles of clown makeup. And it's just a, 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 a historical art form that is very fascinating. And I got a little exposure to Commedia dell'arte. I attended, I failed to mention, I went to Sarah Lawrence College in Bronxville and I studied a year in theater there. And I did Romeo and, Romeo and Juliet Commedia dell'arte style with Ellen Stewart from La Mama Theater in New York City, who had a very famous Commedia dell'arte theater. She came up and turned Romeo and Juliet into a circus and I did my Spanish web act with Harlequin. I was dressed as a Harlequin clown doing an aerial act up in the air. So that was a great experience at Sarah Lawrence College to have that Commedia dell'arte experience. Les, I defer to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, Laura, you know, you just mentioned and I think it is it's a very controversial subject about with the animal rights uh, because that, that affects right. the rodeo as well. It affects so many things. And um, sometimes when you can go so total overboard that you destroy everything in the process. But like you said, now there's certain circuses that have closed down because animals in the circus was a, a, a tremendous big part of, of what the circus is. 
There was also in South Africa the Boswell Winky Circus, which unfortunately also has closed up. Um, I don't know if that was due to the animal rights issue or just because um, demographics and things have changed. But um, you being passionate right. about animals and you being passionate about it, because you like basically in the middle, uh, in your experiences, you know, being in the rodeo and growing up where there were sexes, did you feel that there was any um, abuses to the animals or that, that they shouldn't be included in, in circus or, or the rodeo should continue? What is, I know it's maybe an unfair question to ask you, but you were, you were there on the spot. You, you, um, you've lived it. And, and, and what well, the future should I be? can't vouch for the whole industry, but oh, sure, the sure. people I knew that had animals yeah. were very good to their animals. And, yeah. and there have been, you know, performers, I guess, that they captured that did abuse some of the animals. And it was unfortunate because that hurts the whole industry across the board once you get a few bad apples that are not treating uh -huh. animals the right way and not caring for them the right way. So in, it was very difficult, but um, I know that some of my circus friends um, still are performing with, they might not be traveling with the pandemic and, and different states, they're not allowed in with their elephants, but they just opened a conservatory in Florida, a sanctuary where people come to see like a zoo to see and learn about elephants. So on, on the other hand, it's opened their world in another creative form. Um, they continue to educate people and provide that joy to people because they take very good care of their elephants. So um, I, I just feel it was unfortunate um, to have that happen, you know, how it affected circuses to not be able to bring elephants in to do shows on circuses. I was in White Plains, New York, when the elephants had their last performance and the whole audience just cried because they, they always went to the county center every year to see the circus and the elephants were always there. And the elephants were weeping too with the audience. Like they understood that it was sad. They're never gonna see the elephants come to New York at the county center anymore. So it's a good question you asked. Thank you. Because you know, Laura, it's also it goes Laura. further. It goes for aquariums. It goes for a whole broad spectrum of of you can call it entertainment, but it also brings children into contact with the animal world in in a, in a very positive way. And by banning or saying that it's not good for the animals, in a way, you could be a little bit short sighted because you're depriving the children of having um, this connection, this, this very special connection that they do not Thank get you. their head with the animals. Yeah. I just remember that moment um, and it was so powerful because I took pictures and I just was so sad to you know, know that I would never see that I, circus come again with the elephants, but everything changed when COVID hit. It just like, it wiped out all my circus friends with traveling and business. And they had to find other ways to be creative, to put on another hat and, and use another role to, as drama therapy, we, we learned to do is how to recreate and go on and and know anyone in life who has challenges can get help and make up for lost time and, and learn and move on in life. That's the power of it. it it's so wonderful. Yeah. Now I have a question, I guess. When we met in 2012, the issue, there was a big issue, a big fight in New York City at the time regarding the horses and buggies around Central Park. Yes. I don't remember in 2012 was the Mayor Bloomberg, what his position was, nor do I remember how the issue was resolved. Are there still horses and buggies going around Central Park? Yes. 
<clears throat> they're still there and I don't think they'll ever stop them. I could be wrong, but for now they're, um, they're not giving rides like they used to with COVID, but they're still there and they're still being taken care of. So the battle, I mean, there was a group that wanted to stop it again on the ground that the horses are not treated well. Right. And, and like you said before, with, with anything, yeah. even if most people in any field are okay, there's a few rotten apples, whatever the industry is, which give a bad name to everybody else because they're the ones who get, as when I was uh, in the archive department at CBS Television Network News, that was 1988, the expression was good news is no news. So nobody wanted to talk about that. Could you say something about the coursework to become a registered drama therapist? What kind of coursework does a person have to do, whether it's a field work or papers written or classes? What, what is the core classes that a person must take as opposed to electives in order to become registered? That's a good question, Lowell. Um, like NYU and Hunter College have a very um, good foundation of coursework from um, different courses from um, theory to um, learning techniques and um, different applications of drama therapy. So there's an intense coursework schedule. I remember when I did the program at Hunter, it was like getting a second master's all over again. It was grueling. And not only that, I used to have to go down to 8th Avenue and do training with a group, soci socio drama training and do these role enactments and do weeks and like two years of that. It was grueling and, and doing the supervision with Pat. It was in a very intense um, program. It took me almost five years to become a drama therapist because I was doing it in little segments, working full time, going to school at night, um, doing the hours with the group training and and then you have to put it all together with a supervisor that's taking you on, a board certified trainer. It's called the BCT. And some of my drama therapists do that for new people that would like to become a drama therapist. And they have to review all of their work. So they sit down and they go through everything and say, I, she now has everything that it takes to become a drama therapist. So I remember all that hard work paid off. And I remember when Pat got sick and went to Florida and um, passed away, the board certified trainer had to finish and take me on to complete my requirements. And every two years, we have to submit continuing education units to the board to keep abreast of all the new, new studies and things that are going on in drama therapy. So I'm due this June to review my two years and submit my 30 or I think, yeah, it's 30 CEUs of um, workshops and other credits to keep my um, registry because I have to do that every two years. But that's a good question. Yeah. I pass it over to Les now. And Laura, what advice would you give for aspiring future drama therapists, kids that, boys and girls that actually want to go into this field, it's a very important field to go into, what, what advice would you give them? What, what, what should they prepare for? Or what, you know, what, if they do want to go, is there special requirements or um, do they have to have a, a special interest in, in helping people? What advice would you give? Well, I'll use myself and as an example, being that I, I love circus and I love theater and performing, I knew that I wanted to be able to still perform, but I'm performing in a different arena now. Mm -hmm. I'm taking what I did and what I love and I'm putting it into what I wanted, which was to become a drama therapist 
and use it to heal folks from different populations from nursing home to clinical hospital um like you said Lil, um it's powerful and and it's the stories that matter it's getting one to open up and tell those stories so i i think it's a it's a love that you have to have that drive to want it and feel it and do it because it's real and and we meet all kinds of people in this world with different challenges and 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 it's finding that niche you know i love seniors and i love working with them and and i love working in mental health right now because i do get seniors i don't get just young people but with all different challenges from the correctional side of things to um you know different diagnosis and it helps people it it really is powerful so i i really think one has to really want it and know they want it to do it now now it's my turn to ask a question make a comment which is that if you if we look back over the last 200 years uh let's go back farther when my father, who you know, he when he was a boy, his life was the libraries. That's what he loved to do, read. And when I would visit him, and he would go through these four or five hundred page novels, uh, and I'd say, "Daddy, if you could do what you wanted for the rest of your life and you would live forever, would you do what you're doing now? Were you lying here going through book?" He said, "Yes." I said, "Would you get bored?" He said, "No." And the I don't usually have the patience to read. He was. They were like. A, Tom Clancy kind of thriller or historical books. He, he told me that in the old caravans, in the old days, a very important and respected part of the caravan was the storyteller. Yes, I remember him saying that all oh, the time. Oh, you remember too. And at yes. night, you're around the campfire. <laughs> yes. And that was one of the most important, because what did Correct. you do? You didn't yes. radio, TV, That's smartphones, right, or I call them stupid boxes. So they had that. Then uh, advancing a few thousand years later in the 19th century, uh, one of the reasons people like Jane Austen and the Bronte sisters were so popular was that there was a certain advance in, I think, gas lighting or something before electric, people could stay up longer. And well, what did you do? So you sat together and well, you know, someone could play piano if you had a piano. They would read stories to each other. You had to have stories to read. So you had that. And then I think, I think, think that we're about things have gone sort of into a dead end which is like look at the arts you had vaudeville then there was radio then there was film then there was tv now there's the internet and i remember when i was visiting my father and coming home to the apartment where i stay in riverdale i would sometimes stop at the kosher chinese restaurant which has now been replaced by another one. And I'll never forget what I saw. A family came in, father and a mother, with young children. They sat down at the table, and the father and mother took out the box and looked at the box. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. And the atomization of society that people can't, don't even know how to have a conversation anymore with their own children because they're looking at what I call a stupid box is probably going to cause a reaction in a good sense where people will discover well what could we do in the evening uh, in when there was radio people would sit around listening to the radio but that's not so interactive uh, maybe they would play the banjo or the violin and pe people do more things themselves it would seem to me that the skills uh, call it drama therapy call it what you want of people learning how to be together again and you know have a conversation we'll make a little bit more structured let's do, like the game charades or some kind of role playing so that uh people can learn the lost art of conversation whether it's through music or dance because i can't see how it can go on eventually that people gather in a room 
and everyone just looks at a box. It was bad enough the last years. I'd pass neighbors on the street. I'd say good morning. They wouldn't respond. And then I realized that's they didn't hear me. They had the 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 mm -hmm. CD player and the earphones. I, so little by little, they were disconnecting themselves from the world around them. That is very dangerous for mental health. As the Talmud says, oh, uh, you have, well, who is it? Patrick, give me fellowship or give me death or liberty or death. Give me fellowship or give me death. Isolation leads to insanity and death, literally. And as we both know, research shows that as people get older, what's the main cause of decline and death? It's not a lack of vitamins or exercise or food. It's a lack of company. That's right. So loneliness, yeah. Loneliness has reached epidemic proportions because the technology has evolved far beyond our ability to integrate and use it in an intelligent way. So I imagine that having reached such extremes of disconnection, isolation, and loneliness, it may be a springboard for a renaissance of <clears throat> learning how to interact without a radio, without a TV, without a stupid box, without a movie, without just for people. What are we going to do together? Well, we can sing, we can dance, we can read stories, do what they did for, hundred, for hundreds of years, going back to those storytellers. So I think these skills now are very, very important for the next coming years for the whole world. I think I so. think you're, you're right, Lo, because I find when I do my groups, the patients say, I never knew that about you. And we've been together here in the hospital two months, three months, and you're just telling me this. So there's this connection and linking going on and witnessing and validation. And people learn from each other and grow and and it brings brings one soul out and, and shares. And there's this camaraderie and this, it's a wonderful, wonderful therapy and I see it among my eyes I see the the change and 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 how they like I I helped one young man do a resume he never had anybody ever help him and he said Laura you pulled so much out of me I didn't even know I could fill up two pages with everything I did and and it's just having somebody take that extra step to bring the stories out of them and get it down on paper that's why writers you know right you know low in the film business the writing is, the, is so important it's the writing and the story and telling that story and why do people go to the theater why do people go to a movie to escape to see that story to to identify something maybe in their life that they connect with that they lived so it's healing it's it's that that story you're right it's very powerful i'm going to pass the next question over to les uh, i've already got my next question so laura i i guess i've basically got two questions um but what you were talking about storytelling have you ever instead of the person writing it down actually brought in a video and let them tell it on a video and then you've recorded it so i think that's powerful yeah um, recording the stories and uh, I for their family and for the next generation it's an amazing way that they can actually um, give over their stories you know, um, on video and you actually seeing the person relating their life story um, I'll tell you why I mentioned this I met somebody who's very involved in um, as a historian and she did testimonies of um, um, people who lived basically uh, also survivors, but people who lived in Lithuania, but she did it on cassettes. And today, no one's really interested in the audio cassettes, but they would be exceptionally interested if it was on a video. And in those days, she didn't do it on a video. So it's just an idea that some people can feel very comfortable not everybody, but some do feel comfortable relating their stories on video. And if it, it doesn't have to be made public, it could be just private for the own family, for that it can remain within the family. Uh, that's from my experience. I found the majority do not mind if it goes public, but there are some that don't want it to be public. And it's also okay. It's, it's just incredible hearing them relate their stories. 
Okay. It's funny you mentioned that, Les. One of my drama therapy colleagues suggested, Laura, you must perform your story. One day I want you to just perform it and, and get it out and perform it. And she gave me food for thought thinking, wow, I do have a lot with my background and to perform it and, and, and tell the story in that capacity is enlightening. And I, I, I'm yet to do it and um, do that performance piece. So maybe you should record it. I would like to do that. You should maybe and record, record it. Mm -hmm. And then if you, for some reason, can't be at a certain person, but they'd like to see you, then it's there. It can be on somebody's laptop or on their iPad, and they can still enjoy and learn and um, be healed from your performance that they'll be watching. I would like to like do a PowerPoint presentation. I, I just have to learn, you know, with going to school right now, I, I'm so busy, but to learn that technique to, to do a presentation for folks and tell that story through a PowerPoint presentation, I think is a beginning. Um, or, or even put just, my mother's rodeo pictures up. Or even just yeah. even a video uh, with you, 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 you performing on a video and, uh, and you've documented it. And then it's for prosperity as right. well. Now the other question, Thank well, you. if I can just briefly bring in, yes, go ahead. Um, <laughs> there's a, uh, you know, with, with what's happened with the circus, and it's, I feel actually very sad because as a child growing up, I used to love going to the circus. Whenever it came into town, our parents would take us. And with my two girls, unfortunately in Israel, I don't know if you found it low, but the circus didn't come that often. And when it did come, I did take my girls, but it was not every year. It wasn't a yearly event. It was maybe every five years or I don't know. And they didn't grow up with the same experiences that I had. But the clowns that were in the circus, and I've seen this in some of the hospitals here, there's a medical clown or the clowns can go to the hospitals and blow up balloons and give it to the children or give it to the old people. And there's such a, a need for a medical clown as well. So maybe mm -hmm. those, you know, clowns that were in the circus can reinvent themselves and become medical clowns. It's just an idea. I agree. The Big Apple had a clown care unit in New York with the Big Apple Circus. So they were going to all the major hospitals, Columbia, New York Press, Cornell. Um, I think they're still doing it with COVID. I'm not sure. Um, I haven't been in touch with that program, but it was started in New York. Um, it was a good program. Right yeah. now it's my turn. <laughs> um, <laughs> Le Laura, Les is very modest, so I'll have to handle the public relations here. Not everyone's good at running in front of our own chariots throwing flowers. I actually am not. I'm, I'm much better doing it in front of other people's chariots. So. Uh, Les has a YouTube channel. It's a hobby. He has 30,000, I just checked, 30,815 videos. Wow. 8,000 subscribers and 6,233,880 views. Well, you know wow. better than me. It grows about 100,000. Yeah, I just checked. You know, I check pretty much every day. And I would send you every time he passed 100,000, I would send him Myra singing Miracles Happen from the movie The Princess Diaries. So um, <clears throat> this is something that Les knows a lot about. Now, for me, as you know, uh, you were part of that. Most good ideas I got to do anything came from other people. If someone else had to say, you know, I think you do that well, whatever it is, really? I hadn't thought of that. And then I'll do it. You were the one who, when I met you at my father's um, room, yeah, that wonderful room overlooking the, the, the bridge and the Hudson River said, you're raw talent, you're coming with me next week to the Screen Actors Guild which we did. I still have the photos from that visit with M M Michelle Kinter. And uh, that whole world was a world that I could only have dreamed about. And I agree with Les that you might wanna consider um, maybe someone 
making videos of some of the things that you do so that other people could uh, benefit from them. But wait, there was something else that I had so many things I want to ask. What was it I want to ask? Okay, I mentioned less of statistics, which is that, yes, uh, regarding the issue of storytelling and traumas, uh, Les and I have a lot of, he has much more than I do, contact with people who were in the World War II, whether Jews or non-Jews who went through traumatic experiences, and everyone's different. Some people found it helped them to talk about things, and others the opposite, and everyone's different. I know that in, in Aaron Beck, right, um, be, what's it called? Um, be, not behavioral therapy, the one where you don't talk, you just do stuff. What's that called? Uh, there's a name for it, which not you sit down and talk. They thought not only is it useless, they thought that's destructive. Don't talk, just do. Find something to do and get out of your head by doing stuff. Oh God, what's it called? What that therapy called? Psychoanalytical so, therapy? No, it's the other kind. You know, let's ask in the next question. I'll go look it up. Not come. Laura, can you give us maybe just one or two of the- I found, wait a second, I found, it's called Cognitive Behavioral oh, Therapy. Oh, Cognitive Behavioral, right. Yeah, so Aaron Beck, I think he's still alive from the University of Pennsylvania. I think I have his book, says, as Solomon says, as a man thinks, so he is. And the best way to control our thoughts and feelings is primarily by doing things, not by talking. He had not the- you should have to be a trap monk in a Trappist monastery and take a vow of silence. But the best form of therapy is push a little old lady in a wheelchair or bounce a basketball, do something. Don't talk about it, do about it. That's his basic approach. I would agree. So now I go back to less. I just had to look that up. Okay. Laura, maybe if you could relate just one or two of the stories that uh, the patients have told you without mentioning names, just that we have an idea of the type of work that you do or patients that you've been in contact with. Do they relate their stories of their life with you or the experiences or just funny incidents? Well, I start with my drama therapy sessions with warm-ups and we do, um, a scene where each of us, um, for example, I'll say, what are three things you would never guess about me? And each one of them will, I'll, will try to guess three things about what we would not guess about them. And, and it's amazing what comes up. And then I might do another warm up. If you had this key, what would this key open? And what would you want to see happen? Because we use keys in so many different ways to drive, where we live, where we work. Keys open up so many doors. And um, I just find from the warm up, then I take it a step further and we go into a role play. And I might pair each of them up in twos and they'll interview each other. And then they're gonna to have to present to the group what they learned about their partner and their partner's gonna present what they learned about them. So it, it becomes um, very unique because you're hearing all these different stories, what they learn from each other. And um, so it's, it's a way to open them up and, and share and process and witness and validate. So the stories are powerful and then they feel comfortable because when they see, at first they might feel intimidated or not willing to share, but once they've had that warm up and that trust and they start to trust me, they see that it's fun and it, and it gets them involved and, and then they wanna do more of it and the laughter that comes from it when they see their colleague who they didn't expect to go into character and and perform that story it's it's nice it's an, it's it's always laughter from my room 
I, that, uh, the other staff members say it's drama therapy with Laura because they hear the laughter coming from the room. <laughs> That's lovely. Yeah. That's really lovely. Uh, so Thank now, you. now it's my turn. So we can we can go back and forth. Les and I uh, haven't done this for a few years. Actually, I I haven't done any interviews with anyone. That's different from our lecture series since August two thousand and nineteen. And Les and I did some together. This is in, turning into the first one we're doing in a couple of years. So you can see that when you go to Les's channel, uh, he I I don't know how Les does it because he seems to be able to be in nine hundred places all at once. But he does this countless numbers of interviews with those who are still alive, who want to talk about their lives uh, from what happened in World War II. And we have a lot of trauma victims of Israel from many different backgrounds. As you can imagine, it's a very stressful, high intensity society with a lot of conflict between different ethnic and religious groups. Um, I'm going to check, right, not now, but I'm going to do my homework, get back in a few days to both of you about drama therapy in Israel. Could you, my next question would be in terms of drama therapy, you mentioned the Dr. Marino and the gentleman Phil Jones, I think from England, who is still alive. How has this spread in different countries and are there countries where, again, depending on the culture, people are more receptive to it as opposed to being less receptive to it? I mean, I'm there not are sure. There yeah. are cult, like when you go north, the, the so-called cold cultures where people are less physically demonstrative, that doesn't mean they don't have feelings, they just express them differently. You go south to the warmer countries, the Mediterranean cultures, where people are talk with their hands and are more physically open, depending on the climate and the geography. I know um, that it's popular. Um, I'm not sure in what areas of drama therapy that maybe they're doing, you know, more research. Um, that's a good question, Lowell, to find out and explore with my colleagues because. We have drama therapists all over the United States and the UK. We, we connect with them at conferences every year. And the last two conferences were virtual, which I didn't participate with because with my work and school schedule, it just didn't work out for me. But I know that they're, they're practicing as far as Australia there we we've, we've had um a drama therapist from australia and and it's branching out and and it's growing so i think it continues to grow and i know england is very much ahead of us with it they come up with other techniques and research and and it's wonderful that we have that collaboration with the uk because it only helps us to grow and learn. And I, I, I'm happy to ha know we have the conference every year. Yeah. I'll ask a question. Um, um, Laura, um, you dealing with, say, older patients, have you ever come across situations where, like, um, say, a grandfather is estranged from uh, a grandchildren or from from their own their own children and maybe you as a drama therapist could bridge the gap and through drama therapy um, reunite or reconnect the family members that have been estranged has that ever happened or could that ever no. happen it does happen I give them the tools to reconnect with their family members. I've had that happen and they look for ways of, I do the empty chair role play. I put their father or their mother or their brother or sister in that chair. And I say to them, what is it that you want to tell them that you haven't told them in oh, years? It's amazing. And you want to get it out. So they role play with the chair and then it builds them up 
to make that beginning to make a phone call to write a letter to have their caseworker their team work with them to explore that family dynamic once they leave the hospital they have a team working it's called an act team and that act team works with them and and i've seen success and i see it wow. and it's wonderful yeah. they, must, they must give you a tremendous sense of satisfaction uh reconnecting and reuniting um family members that have been and it's also it's interesting you use reconnecting and reuniting but it's also where i teach them too to be independent to not depend on mommy or daddy because it only does them more harm if they can't be independent and learn for themselves to make a break and show their parents that they can be independent they can do their own thing and have that that chance to to do it to to know what it's like even though they have their illness that they're working with it allows them to grow and and make a new start in life and and then write a new chapter because i tell them it was hard for me growing up i didn't have anybody helping me so it only made me stronger and a survivor and when they hear my story and some of them come from very privileged homes in westchester connecticut you name it and were pampered their whole life it does more harm than good so if they they learn those skills to be independent and go out on their own because i say to them what if you didn't have mommy or daddy how are you going to survive so think of how you're going to go forward on your own it's great that you still have your parents but you have to know that you have to have that skill and you have to learn it and work with it but you take somebody like me to make it reality to face to hear to to take it in to to process it wow so i'm just what, what i was up. what i was going to mention yes you go ahead no no you go ahead all right uh about cultures and different cultures I'm not really a fan of it. I have nothing against it, but there's these Japanese cartoons, Kanja and Manja, which began in Japan and became phenomenally popular in, in Western Europe, the United States. These, uh, you even have movies made with these strange kind of cartoon characters, but it's not like Walt Disney cartoons. Manja, I have to look that up. There are two art forms that again, began in one country and became phenomenally popular in other countries, certainly in, in the Western countries. I know in the, in the Arab world, there are two singers. Uh, one has been dead for 30 years. Her name is Um Khaltum. She was a single woman, not from a rich family. Her father noted she had musical talent and she wrote her own music it's hard for us to understand what the she and Fairuz, who's about 84 and lives in Lebanon, is from Christian background, mean to Muslims, especially the Arab Muslim world is very patriarchal. But ask any Arab, mention any kid here, Um Khaltum. Oh, you know about Um Khaltum. When they finish the mosque in the morning, they listen to Um Khaltum. She's been dead 30 years. When they finish the mosque in the evening, they listen to Fairuz. She's still alive. And these were ladies where they, they can sing a song, they start chanting, uh, they can go on for an hour. Now talk about star power. No disrespect to Michael Jackson and Madonna and the Beatles. This lady's been dead for 30 years, but all over the Arab world, I'm not sure if the general Muslim world, every person listens to Um Khaltum, if you go to the morning and Fairuz, the jewel of Lebanon, the rose of Lebanon in the evening. Now that's cultural power when you can, I don't know why it is these two ladies and that they're ladies also in a male society, 
are have a status. So that's what I was driving at with something like drama therapy, where it would be received differently in different countries. Maybe some countries say, well, you know, well, we really can't do something like that. Maybe we'd feel silly. I don't know how the Japanese would feel about it. It's a very, that the Kabuki theater, everything's very structured and organized and disciplined. That, that's what I was driving at. And I did want to mention that many years ago, in fact, I even remember where, where I was, you know, the, the, the Tarrytown Lakes. So I was driving around there on the way home to my parents in one of the visits and on the radio, there was a report about how uh, Shakespeare was being used in prisons in Les's country. We came from South Africa. And for some reason, the prison system found that when they had mostly boys who were in there for causing various forms of trouble, did Shakespeare and got a role. Okay, you be King Lear, you being Macbeth, you be Henry VIII. It actually helped them improve for some reason. So this was fascinating to me. This was before I actually went and did those student films in the uh, October, November. It was all very quick of 2011, where I had read in one of my books on autism that people with Asperger's profile liked acting because of the defined role playing. I think that's a key concept, whether one is on the spectrum or not, defined role playing. Not everyone's gonna get up and be a improv, a sing and dance and, and feel fine to express yourself. But if it's defined role playing, say, okay, now you be Marie Antoinette. You be, I don't know, uh, here, read this from Julius Caesar. And this is what's very good about the English public school system, which means private school, because they drive on the wrong side of the road and they call public schools private schools, is especially the boys are trained from an early age to do public speaking. One thing I read in my research is more people, people are more afraid of public speaking than sharks leave me out after I saw Jaws, I won't go in the ocean anymore. I just won't. I don't mind scuba diving because I can see what's around me, but I can't stand being in the water thinking what might be right below my feet till today. But more people are more scared of public speaking than snakes, spiders, and sharks. Pa pa paranoid, uh, terrified. So what do they do? They get the little boys from when they're very little and say, okay, take this, stand in front of the class and read. You don't have to be Churchill. And even Churchill had a, a lisp and a stutter that he had to overcome to become Churchill. Say, read this. I think, I don't know, if I was running the educational system, which in Israel and America, I think is a complete disaster and waste of money. I say, okay, skip all these courses you don't need. Let's get down to basics. And one of them is, I would say, okay, everybody has to learn, do physical stuff. It will make kids less nervous, uh, dance, sing. You don't have to be Fred Astaire and you don't have to be Ethel Merman, just be yourself and do that because it's very therapeutic. And again, once you get past it, someone will think I'm silly or stupid or I'm not perfect. Get rid of all that. Just sing and dance and tell your story and don't worry about being perfect. Like Julia Cameron says, don't think it up, just write it down. Don't be perfect, just be finished. You can't argue with that for simple reason because she's right. So I would introduce that into the educational system right away. It's simple. It doesn't require any fancy equipment. And again, uh, oftentimes, well, Les might know this from Yiddish, uh, the, remember the, the Jewish hotels and the Catskills in the 30s and 40s and 50s? They understood that people were not, many people were self-conscious. They had the tumbler, whose job was to entertain everyone. And they had something which showed a wonderful sense of concern for feelings. Maybe there were some girls who weren't so pretty and weren't being asked to dance. There was a guy, his job, his job was to go and ask the girls to dance. Well, if you're from religious background, we don't have mixed dancing, but that didn't apply there. If someone was sitting alone, his job was to go and ask her to dance. Someone had no one to talk to, 
that someone would sit down and talk to them. I think that's a wonderful humane tradition that you paid someone to do that. And most people are not, uh, you know, like you and I are good at uh, the arts, singing, dancing, improvisational theater, but most people are not very self-conscious that the defined role playing is very important because say, okay, we, you don't have to forget about being spontaneous. That's not going to work. It's not going to happen here. Uh, sing this, read that, go, you're on. And also to get people used to some people, uh, aside from trauma, are afraid to be in a video or, in, or they don't like the sound of their voice. They don't like the way they look. Um, everybody, we can't see ourselves as others. And to get over that is not easy. Say, so, okay. Lights, camera, action. Many people that drop dead before they say record. No, they freeze. Mo, you know what that's called? Theater of spontaneity. Marino was big into that. Theater of spontaneity. Just letting it all come yeah. out. Spontaneous. Pass it, I'm going to pass it back to Les now. We're coming to, it's almost nine o'clock, so we'll have to conclude, but I want to give the last question to him, and we want to give the last comment to you. Okay, um, so it's not really a question, it's just an observation. Laura, I asked you um, for aspiring um, students, aspiring um, teenagers that want to go into the field that you're in as drama therapists, what, what qualities or what should they look for? And I think your presentation tonight and you speaking to us, you've shown us you have to be, and this is what you really are, you're passionate. You're passionate about what you do and you're caring. You are so caring about, I think, each and individual um, patient that you see, each and individual person that you come into contact with. And that's why you're so successful. And that's why it comes across, because it's from your heart. And I think from... You know, Lola and me, listening to your incredible presentation tonight, it really, really, it just overflows your, your sincerity and your devotion to your profession. And it's really been an absolute delight to hear just the most amazing work that you do and the most important work that you do. And um, we just hope that you get registered very quickly because there's a lot of people that need your services. And uh, on behalf of the Rutan branch, and Lola, I'm so grateful to you for including me in this. It's been such an honor and a privilege to hear you tonight. So I want to really thank you. Thank you, you Les. Much. Thank you so much. And, and you're right, I do care. And I had a patient tell me that he could tell that I really cared. And that meant so much to him. And he said the same thing you said to me that you're good at what you do, Laura, because you really care. And, and that means a lot and you can't fake it. it it's gotta be it's real. real and it's very real. thank you. So thank you so much. And I hope your friendship and your connection with Lowell continues to, you know, it's amazing. You both are very special and uh, really it's been thank such you. a pleasure to hear you tonight. I always will continue to carry his dad's memory with me and continue that friendship. They were like family. His family were like my family. And, and the Hebrew home's a ghost town now. Nobody's allowed to go there. And it's a whole different world there. I want to go back there and visit so much, but it's just not happening right now. But I call in and I give messages to um, say hello to our friends there, Lowell. Dave and um, the director of volunteers and yeah, thank you both. Laura, it's thank been you a wonderful much. time together. I couldn't agree more. All the very, very best. Thank you, Les. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lowell. Take care. God bless. God bless, Bonnie.